this video contains two giveaways. What's up ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another advanced mechanics guide from the dancing Danish dagger stabbing you with life. Here to proudly present the guide, I am your host, the Party Knife. Introductions and Guide Overview Hello! Now after a quick introduction, first off we're gonna go straight into the, all of the important metrics as always and explain all of the passive abilities and how they actually function. Followed by a detailed explanation of all of her talents, of which one is outright lying and one is misleading, although correct. Followed by a detailed guide on the most insane quick play build in the entire game. Followed up by a bit of vermin science, illuminating the mechanics of setting stuff on fire, which neatly sets you up for the battle wizard slow cooker build, which is amazing for weaves. Followed by a quick guide showcasing the single most important tips for the battle wizard's five most used weapons. After which there's a whole segment dedicated to make monsters go fly fly using the firewalk ability. Followed by a selection of high level weave gameplay clips used to illustrate a bunch of important things like how not to die and proper positioning. Last but not least in an effort to wind it all up and tie it together we have yet another collection of high level weave gameplay clips in an effort to flex my bicep I, I mean I mean teach you in an effort to teach you something about uh, thi things and stuff. Important things and important stuff or something. Anyways. It's quite clear from my YouTube analytics that your favorite videos are my mastery guides. Now this is by far the best edited, most coherent and well structured mastery guide I've made so far. I've put my heart and soul into this video and racked up something like 70 hours of just pure editing. And I really 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 care what you think of this video so if you make it all the way through let me know what you think down in the comments below and don't forget to join us, join us. High five! Anyways, let's get started. Passives and important metrics. Let's start out by clearing some of the basics. The battle wizard has an HP pool of 100 which can be increased to 120 assuming 20% health on the necklace. Furthermore she has a total of 40 overcharge which is equivalent to both the pyromancer and the unchained. And her career ability is tied for the third lowest cooldown in the game along with Slayer at a maximum cooldown time of 40 seconds. Which is replenished by one quarter of a second per enemy minion damaged as well as half a second per damage taken. Meaning a total of 80 damage would replenish your entire ulti in an instant. Moving on to passive abilities of which the battle wizard has three. Pyromantic Surge which is a permanent 10% ranged damage modifier that's automatically active at all times. Then we have Tranquility. After not casting spells for 6 seconds, your overcharge decay speed is increased by plus 200%. In relation to the base decay rate, which is 0.6 overcharge per second, after a delay of half a second. Last but not least, we have Reckless Haste. Overcharge increases spell charging speed by 10% per stack which are reached at 6, 12 and 18 overcharge, significantly increasing the rate at which the battle wizard can charge and cost her ranged attacks. But with the passives out of the way, let's move on to part 3. All talents and how they work explained in detail. Up first we have Confound. Now, Confound basically just generates temporary HP based on the stagger strength of your melee attacks. The stronger the stagger, the more HP you get. Then we have Spark Thief, which generates a fixed amount of temporary HP whenever you last hit a minion with your melee weapon, depending on the minion type. And you can see the exact numbers in the table I've added on the left. Just like all other heroes in the game, your third and final option consists of heal share, providing any of your teammates in close proximity upon consumption of a healing item with 20% of their maximum HP as well as turning them healthy. Up first for the level 10 talent is Volcanic Force. Fully charging a spell increases its power by 50%. Now this is one of those talents that you can build the entire battle wizard around, which is absolutely fucking insane. Now keep in mind that this is a boost to the core power, not the damage which means on top of the added cleave and stagger, it also takes into account all of your other modifiers. So let's say you had 30% versus chaos and armored, and you did a fully charged attack. That attack would now effectively get plus 45% versus armored, because it assumes 30% of a power of 975, 
rather than 30% of your actual power of 650. And keep in mind it also stacks multiplicatively with things like Strength Pot, Hunter, Barrage or Enhanced Power. Up next we have Varnished Flames, which is basically a 1.5 damage multiplier, which is added to all of your flaming damage over time effects regardless of their source. However, this effect doesn't come free of charge. The talent has a trade-off, which simultaneously reduces your damage output from all other sources by 30%, meaning all conceivable scenarios of you outputting damage, with the one exception of the raw damage output from your flaming dot, have a 0.7 multiplier added to their damage output. Up next we have Lingering Flames, which was quite a controversial talent in the previous weave season. Now, what the talent does is pretty straightforward. Your dot simply becomes permanent. Once you set an enemy on fire, he stays on fire, and will keep burning all the way to his death. Although there is one exception to this, which I'll get into more detail with later in the guide. Now, if you're thinking, that doesn't seem so broken, I mean, the dot doesn't deal that much damage. Well, the thing is, in Season 1, you could pair it up with Varnished Flames to craft a build which would eventually be known as the slow cooker, since the idea was to just apply your dot to as many minions as possible, and then don't stop blocking until everything was dead. Thankfully, Fat Shark realized that this was morbidly OP, and so they did a little switcheroo on the Battle Wizard's talents, forcing us to choose between the two talents in order to balance everything out. But even so, this is still a highly viable talent for a variety of different builds, and especially shines in scenarios where you're getting overwhelmed. Although not unlike Volcanic Force, in order for the talent to truly be effective, you have to understand the underlying mechanics and adjust your playstyle accordingly. Which brings us to the Stagger talents. Now, Boulevard is essentially your normal stagger modifiers of 20 and 40%, but with the added bonus of applying a 2 second debuff to all enemy minions upon staggering them, which adds a 10% or 1.1 damage multiplier to all incoming damage from melee sources, including and thus benefiting the DPS output of your entire team. Up next we have Smiter, which has been patched since I did my sell it guide and should now function properly. Assuming a stagger count equal to 1 on the first enemy that your attack encounters, giving a 20% damage bonus to the first enemy you hit every attack without losing your basic stagger modifiers. Last but not least we have Enhanced Power, which despite what it says, grants a 7.5% raw power buff, which is added prior to any other damage multipliers and just like Volcanic Force, stacks multiplicatively with all other buffs, things like Strength Pots, Barrage, Hunter, as well as your item's power versus properties. This is the only stagger talent which affects range damage as well as damage over time. And although it's not mentioned, you still retain your plus 20 plus 40 melee damage stagger modifiers. Up first for level 20 we have Unusually Calm, which reduces the window in which you can't cast spells in order to activate Tranquility from a total of 6 seconds to a total of 3 seconds or a reduction of 50%, substantially increasing the versatility of Tranquility. Up next we have Rechannel. When Tranquility is active, CNS ranged charge time is reduced by 40%, which means whenever you haven't cast any spells for 6 seconds and Tranquility is active, the charge up time of the next spell you cast will be only 60% of the normal duration it would take to fully charge it. Keep in mind that this effect can only be utilized once between each Tranquility recharged, as the casting of any spell will remove Tranquility and reset the 6 second cooldown. Which brings us to Sendert, which increases the vending effect of Tranquility by 100%. Now at first this seems obvious, right? It obviously doubles the effect of Tranquility. But that's actually not the case, because the way Tranquility works is it increases your overcharge decay speed by 200%. So when this says it increases the decay speed by 100%, it's really changing a bonus of 200% to a bonus of 300%, which when added together with the base decay speed, which is obviously 100%, leaves us with an actual increase from 300 to 400%, which is equivalent to a 33% increase in the rate at which your overcharge decays. Up first for level 25 we have Soot Shield, which does exactly what it says it does. Igniting an enemy reduces damage taken by 10% for 5 seconds and stacks up to 3 times. This essentially means that whenever you do an AoE burning attack, whether it's with your staff or with your melee weapon, you gain a 30% damage reduction multiplier to damage from all sources, which stacks with traits like bar skin and is easy to keep at max charges all the time. Moving on to Fires from Ash, 
Killing a burning enemy reduces the cooldown of Firewalk by 3%. Now, Firewalk has a cooldown of 40 seconds, meaning 1% is 0.4 seconds, so 3% is 1.2 seconds. However, in order for fires from Ash to trigger, the burning dot has to be active on the minion as it dies, and you have to get the killing blow. Which is why it's often used in combination with Lingering Flames, due to the very short-lived nature of Sienna's Burning Dot. And that should be all there was to say about Fires from Ash. But, as I was scavenging my guide for potential flaws, I realized that I had never actually noticed the direct effect of this talent, and so I decided to go and do some testing just in case. And initially came to the conclusion that it provided half a second of cooldown reduction per enemy burning minion. Now, I don't have a degree in mathematics, but I'm pretty sure 3% of 40 seconds is not half a second. But something just didn't feel right about that either. So I did some more research, a <coughs> Google search, <laughs> for real, it actually took me quite a while to find a reference. But eventually I did, and I tested it, and as it happens, it does in fact provide a 3 second cooldown reduction to your career building. It's just that they totally forgot to mention anywhere at all that it has a half a second buffer, or cooldown if you will, which prevents it from triggering multiple times. Which is fine, I, I don't mind that at all. But you know, it'd be nice to know, since just applying your infinite dot and letting it burn out means everything is gonna die simultaneously, so even 20 kills would be a 1.2 second cooldown reduction, when really you could be knowing that you should space them apart intentionally in order to maximize the value. But anyways, let's move on to the next tell. Then we have Immersive Immolation, which upon hitting 4 enemies with the same attack, regardless of whether it's melee or ranged increases your attack speed by 15% for the next 5 seconds. Which is plenty of time to continuously re-trigger the buff, essentially granting you a permanent 15% attack speed bonus, which also increases the odds of triggering a critical hit, essentially turning you into a flaming lawnmower whenever swift slaying is active. First up for the level 30 career ability talents, we have Volan's Quickening, which reduces the cooldown of Firewalk by 30%. Now, since Firewalk has a total cooldown of 40 seconds, 10% is equal to 4 seconds, meaning 30% is equal to 12 seconds, which, when subtracted from 40 seconds, gives us a cooldown of 28 seconds. But up next we have... Kaboom! Which trades away the Burning Trail for an increased explosion radius and burn damage from the dot applied specifically by the ulti, however removing the Burning Trail vastly decreases the amount of enemy minions you are able to ignite, all for an increased damage over time effect that can still be outcompeted by the damage over time effect applicable by the Beamstaff M1. But worst of all is you'd have to pick it instead of Burnout which is the last, but by no means the least, of all the Battle Wizards talents. In fact, it's probably the single most amazing of all the Battle Wizards talents. Wanna stagger an entire patrol and set everything between you and it on fire? Jerk! Wanna take out monsters so quickly your shade develops self-esteem issues? Jerk! Wanna laugh as you drink a Kong pot, overtake a handmaiden and disappear into the horizon? Jerk! Wanna rescue your best friend with no effort from a pool of minions so thick he realizes he's a scrub? Jerk! Wanna give fewer fucks than quantum mechanics and simply appear at places it shouldn't be possible to be? Jerk! Anyways, let's move on. <laughs> Battle Wizard Legendary Build The One Hit Wonder so for normal quick play, whether it's Legend or Kata, one of the most amazing builds you can do is the one hit wonder. Now what I've done here is I've equipped the basic talents, Volcanic Force, Enhanced Power, and a Bolt Staff. And then I've removed all power versus traits on all of my items. Now the reason I've done that is to show you guys that even with 0% power versus, a fully charged Bolt Staff attack can pretty much one shot anything with a body shot. And keep in mind, this is with 0% power versus anything. Yet it can one-shot body shot any special in the game. But I know what you're probably thinking. Well, what can't it one-shot body shot? Well, a fully charged bolt can one-shot everything shy of a Chaos Warrior, Bistigore, and Mulder. However, this is a totally solvable problem. Because we really only need 20% versus Chaos or Infantry in order to one-shot body shot a Bistigore. 10% Chaos, 10% Infantry, and BOOM! Guaranteed one-shot Pistigore kills. But that's not enough, is it? Because we still have this little issue called a Mauler. And oh my god, do I fucking hate Maulers. When I was new at this game, do you have any fucking idea how long it took me to figure out that they take longer to kill if you shoot them in the head? But it's okay, because I will have my revenge. Battle Wizard One-Shot Wonder. 20% versus Chaos, 20% versus Infantry. 
guaranteed one shot body shot mauler. And you know what? That leaves only one minion. Just one. Chaos Warrior. Now in order to guarantee a one shot body shot on a Chaos Warrior, all you gotta do is, yeah, and that, no, no, that's not possible. However, it is possible to two shot them with a double fully charged headshot. No crits required. Now just take a moment to think about that. Now we're talking Cataclysm minions here, okay? Cataclysm difficulty. You can guarantee a one shot, a one attack, body shot on any special, any elite in the game with the one exception of a Chaos Warrior. Which again, you can take out in no more than two shots, assuming your aiming isn't fucking horrible. But there's more. Cause 40% versus Chaos and Infantry happens to hit another really, really interesting breakpoint, which happens to be exactly what the Bolt Staff needs. Now, as we've established pretty firmly, this Bolt Staff build can cut through armor and minions, like a 10 trillion watts per square centimeter laser could cut through cotton candy. But one of the downsides is the spark attack, the left click, can only hit one minion per projectile. However, simply spamming uncharged heavy attacks is in fact equally horrible. That is until you apply. 40% power versus chaos and in infantry allows for completely uncharged bolts to one-shot fanatics, killing multiple enemies per attack, significantly boosting its capabilities versus hordes. Now, if I was quick playing Cataclysm with this build, my own personal preference would always be to run cooldown reduction and stamina recovery, either of which should be swapped for curse resistance, assuming you're planning to pick up Grimoire's. Personally, I prefer Explosive Ordnance as it increases my chances of pushing stuff off ledges. But honestly, it's not really that crucial to the functionality of the build. Same goes for the charm, whether you prefer Decanter, Proxy, or Concoction, I'd say all three goes in this scenario. Although you should always keep in mind that mathematically speaking, Proxy is the better of the three traits. Now, in terms of the necklace, I'd say it really depends on your choice of melee weapon, as well as what kind of fight you're uh, expecting to get into. Me personally, I prefer health and stamina most of the time, and at least when I'm solo queuing, I like to run bar skin as it really complements the suit shield. And don't forget to pair up your melee weapon with your temporary HP generating talent. And although it's not a necessity, I would recommend something like a fire sword or a dagger, since you can basically one-shot anything with your ranged weapon. So the point of equipping your melee weapon is generally gonna be a matter of survival. So you better make sure it has decent mobility and can generate temporary HP. But with that said, let's get going and move on to the next chapter. Not all flames are ignited equal. Goddamn racist fire. Now this chapter is going to be all about the flaming dot, and I've set up a couple of experiments in order to illustrate why it isn't as straightforward as it might seem. Now this first experiment is primarily just to illustrate what I'm doing on a much larger scale in the next experiment, as well as revealing one of those small deviations from the rest of the mechanics that are hidden, obscured from sight, aren't mentioned anywhere. And whilst at first it might seem like a small, tiny, and insignificant deviation, it's precisely that type of lack of consistency, or consistent inconsistencies, which makes the game both beautiful, amazing, but also makes it super fucking complicated to make these guides. I mean, or you could just skip lightly over the unnecessarily complicated minor mechanics, which don't really affect the overall gameplay that much. Never must stay. 100% factual. Oh yeah, that's right, the experiment. So basically what I've done is I've taken each of the melee weapons and I've applied their melee sequence dot. That is after I used the mod to reduce my damage output to 0%, allowing me to apply all of the different dots and then start the damage simultaneously. Speaking of which, all of them are dead, except for one. They all died within a time span of less than one second, except for one. And it wasn't a coincidence either, he would have died last no matter how many times you replicated this experiment. So which one was it? Flaming Sword, Heavy Attack 2. So on the left side at the number 1 you have Firewalk, Direct Hit, with and without Kaboom. At number 2 we have Fireball Staff, Fully Charged Attack and a Minimum Charged Attack. At number 3, demonstrating what we learned in the previous experiment with a Heavy 1 and a Heavy 2 from the Flaming Sword. At number 4 we have the charge up attack from the flamestorm staff. At number 5 we have a fully charged conflag staff and a minimally charged conflag staff. 
Last but not least, we have the Beam Staff Heavy Attack Dot and the Beam Staff Light Attack Dot. Now, there's a couple of things you should know about damage over time effects. First up, they don't stack, meaning only one damage over time effect can be present at any given minion at any given time. But more than that, they also can't be reapplied. An example would be you have a 3 second damage over time effect, you apply it, 2 seconds passes, you reapply your damage over time effect. What happens? Well, 1 second later, you no longer have a damage over time effect on the given minion. This mechanic is especially important to take into consideration whenever playing the slow cooker build, as any low DPS dot you apply to a potential monster is permanent and will last until it's dead, with one noticeable exception, although it still remains out of your control. But if you have a Bardian on your team with a Drake Fire weapon and he applies his burning dot, it will take priority over yours, removing your burning dot and applying his. So do make sure you keep that in mind. Now, not unlike most other attacks in the game, the overall DPS output of your damage over time effect is calculated based on your raw hero power, which is multiplied by some number depending on which attack you use. Keep in mind that stacker of any kind does not affect your dot's damage, however your power versus properties on your items do, although only while they are equipped. Let's say we apply our burning dot to a storm burning, and our dot has a damage output of 10 every second. But let's say we put 10% power versus Skaven and 10% versus Armored on our charm, as well as on our staff. Well, obviously our dot will take for 14 damage per second, that is until we swap weapons to our crit chance attack speed flaming sword, because whilst our melee weapon is equipped, it will only take for a total of 12 damage per second, until we bring our staff back out, upon which it will return back to 14 per second. So whilst the dot damage based on the attack type you did is fixed, any other buff such as Hunter, Barrage, a Strength Pot only increases the damage while it's active and thus you don't have to bother drinking your Strength Pot before applying the dot. Anyways, I think that just about covers all of the technicals regarding damage over time effects which I thought was appropriate to do before we got to the slow cooker build. So uh, let's up the damage so we can get some data. Now in just a moment the first one is gonna drop. Place your bets, place your bets. Which one do you think it will be? What staff has the best dot in the game? And the winner is... The Beam Staff M1. Hmm. Interesting. Quickly followed by her career ability with the Kaboom talent. So no surprises there. Nine contestants left, but who will take the bronze medal? Could it be... The one. The only... Oh, for fuck's sake. I fucking hate the Flamestorm staff. It's like, I don't care if it was on sale at 90% discount and had an unobtainable trait allowing for infinite overcharge use, I still wouldn't run the fucking Flamestorm stuff. Like, it would require a rework of such epic proportions that the Flamestorm staff better be shooting ballistic fucking missiles if you want me to incorporate it in any viable Sienna build. Anyways, speaking of junk, it's giveaway time! You heard that right, motherfucker! So the first person to correctly list the death order of all 11 minotaurs, sorted by the attack used to apply the dot, wins a free steam key for Warhammer Vermintide 2 the game, which is perfect for being super annoying and guilt tripping one of your friends into playing the game with you. <laughs> yes! I'll even list the first three ones for you, although you don't need to bother with the time, as long as you have the right order and the right attack. And if you're thinking, but wait! You didn't show us the specific attack you used for every single Minotaur. Or did I? All I'm gonna say is go back to the point where I listed them from 1 to 6, listen carefully, and apply just a tiny bit of common sense, and you should be able to fill in the few remaining gaps. But anyways, enough about freaking dots. Let's move on to part 6. Battle Wizard Legendary Build. The Slow Cooker Weave Edition. Now, one of the primary reasons I opted to do the Battle Wizard next was specifically due to the Season 2 Weave patch, in which they fixed something like 9 out of 10 of the overarching issues, making them genuinely enjoyable to play. Now, I'm just quickly gonna go through my most used variation of the Battle Wizard for high level weave play, but in order to leave more time for actual gameplay examples, which I feel like I've been missing a lot in some of my other mastery guides, I am gonna restrain myself to only explaining the absolute essentials, 
However, I have been contemplating doing a weave guide in a more general sense, explaining the different wins, the tactics you should use to approach them, what constitutes a good hero setup, and who knows, maybe even a bonus section of all the cheese spots that I'm aware of in the current season of weaves. So if that's something you guys would like me to make, then please let me know down in the comments below. But for now, let's get back to the battle wizard. Now, a pretty standard feature of almost any weave build, at the very least once you start reaching up towards 100, is running 30% block cost reduction on your weapon along with 2 stamina, and usually you're gonna fill the rest in with something like attack speed. And for weaves specifically, I usually run off balance, in order to maximize my survivability. Under the assumption that sooner or later, due to lingering flames, everything will die eventually if you can just survive for long enough. Now, in terms of the Conflag staff, it's pretty simple. You're always gonna be running power versus chaos, and either power versus infantry or armored, depending on the scenario. And although barrage is technically an option, I would say thermal equalizer is just far better, since more casting means more dots and more stagger. Now, on the top circle equivalent of the charm, you're gonna be running power versus chaos, and again, either power versus infantry or armored, depending on what you're focusing at or struggling with in that specific weave. Decanter if you're selfish, proxy if you're generous, and concoction if the entire map is filled with nothing but speed pots. Now, for the second circle, which is equivalent to the necklace, again, you're gonna be running 30% block cost reduction, two stamina, and fill up the rest with health. Now, if you're running heal share, you might want to consider Boon of Shalia. Otherwise, get Barskin since it synergizes really well with Suit Shield. Now, a neat little feature of the third circle, which is equivalent to the trinket, is that you can get 5% movement speed filling only one slot, which is pretty much universally worth it regardless of your hero, since you can trade it for something like 1% crit chance or 2% cooldown reduction. Furthermore, stamina recovery is an absolute must, and then personally, I prefer to fill out the rest with cooldown reduction and explosive ordinance. Now, in terms of the talent build, I usually get either heal share or temp HP based on stagger, along with obviously lingering flames and enhanced power, the vastly superior unusually calm, along with suit shield for protection, and of course, burnout. With an entire chapter dedicated just to teaching you guys how to push bosses off ledges. But first, Spill casting and melee mastery. Now, for this segment, I thought I'd just quickly walk you through the five most used weapons of the Battle Wizard, along with a couple of tips on how to use them effectively the dagger, the fire sword, the bolt staff, the beam staff, and the conflag staff. Now, in a lot of ways, the dagger and the fire sword are very, very similar. They both have an effective dodge count of 3, as well as a 20% dodge distance modifier. But where the dagger shines is in terms of raw movement speed. Now, if you didn't know this already, all weapons featuring a dagger, whether it be Sienna's dagger, dual daggers, or sword and dagger, have a 50% stamina cost modifier associated with their push. Which means the cost of doing a push, or in this case a push block attack, is one stamina or half a shield, rather than two stamina, an entire shield. Which is why you always see speedrunners using the dagger, as the push block attack of CMS Dagger increases your distance traveled. Now the light attacks are great for clearing trash, and as I demonstrated earlier, the dot applied from Heavy 1 and Heavy 2 are identical. However, Heavy Attack 2 on the Dagger by far has the best armor damage output. Moving on to the Fire Sword. Now, as I said, the Fire Sword is very similar in a lot of ways, and although it doesn't have a 50% modifier associated with its push, it does however have an increased effective push block angle of 90 degrees rather than the Dagger's 40. But by far the most important part of using the Fire Sword successfully is being able to cycle the first heavy attack indefinitely. By doing a fairly simple animation cancel in between each attack, which is achieved by simply blocking for a moment before channeling the next attack. And it's very important you get comfortable with this mechanic if you're running high level weaves, since as we concluded earlier, there's a huge difference in the damage output of the dot applied by Heavy 1 and Heavy 2, specifically in the case of the Fire Sword. Now again, as we concluded earlier, the Beam Stop had the single highest DPS of all CNS damage over time effects. Which should leave you wondering why the heck everyone isn't running Beam Stop on the Battle Wizard. But the reason for this is quite simple. The beam staff has three different applicable damage over time effects. And it makes sense that the one with the highest damage output is also the hardest to apply. 
as it requires holding down the M1 attack for a total of 4 hits before the 5th and final attack will apply the dot to one target. With that said, although I don't think the beam staff is the best choice for the battle wizard specifically, the beam staff in of itself is never horrible, since it by far provides the most versatile range of attacks of any of Sienna's staffs, and is definitely what I would recommend for new Sienna players in order to learn the hero. Now, as I showed you guys earlier in the one shot wonder build, the bolt staff can be made to pretty much one shot whatever you want it to. But the absolutely crucial thing to learn here is using a sound cue to determine when your heavy attack is fully charged, which is absolutely essential as the 50% power is only applied upon maximum charge. And keep in mind this is not a fixed number. If you recall in the beginning of this video when I went over her passive abilities, the speed at which she charges her heavy attacks is reduced by 10, 20 and 30% upon reaching an overcharge of 6, 12 and 18 out of the total 40. So in order to be both effective and consistent, you want to listen very carefully as you charge each attack in order to identify the sound marker indicating a fully charged attack. Now I've gone through the extra trouble of trying to visualize it for you here. Now what you want to notice is the gap between the obvious sound cue and the attack actually being fully charged. Now, do keep in mind that this is not an actual accurate visual interpretation of the sounds involved, but rather a rough estimation made to better communicate and illustrate how to properly interpret the sound cues in order to consistently produce fully charged bolt attacks in the smallest possible practical time frame. In other words, the bolt staff is an amazing ranged weapon, although admittedly it does have quite a high skill cap if you compare it to something like the beam staff. Last but not least, we have the poster boy for the slow cooker build, the Conflag Staff. Now, if I were to ask you to estimate just how big the circle has to be in order to ignite every single storm vermin in this circle, you might very logically but wrongfully assume that, well, at the very least, it would have to be something like this big, right? I mean, the circle isn't even touching the outer storm vermins. But, uh, surprise, motherfucker! It doesn't even have to be half that size. In fact, it barely has to touch the inner storm vermins in order to apply it to the outside storm vermins. Don't believe me? Watch this. Literally all it takes is a charge of time of maybe 0.1 to 0.2 seconds, more than just holding right click and spamming left click, and every single one of the storm vermins has been ignited. Now, do keep in mind though that the damage output of an uncharged dot is significantly lower than a fully charged one. However, this allows you with 40 overcharge and thermal equalizer to spam a total of 15 charge attacks in a row before maxing out and igniting way more enemies in a smaller time frame for less overcharge. Although, just to be clear, if you do aggro a patrol, you definitely want to start out doing a fully charged attack. But you simply don't always have the time for that. If you're on the move and you want to ignite as many minions as possible, it's way quicker and way more efficient to simply pop a bunch of small charged attacks rather than a couple of big ones. Which also has the added bonus of being able to target and apply the dot to a landscape of very scattered minions where the fully charged attack requires that you have a horde or area of high minion density in order to really be worth it. Furthermore, this option can also be used as a tool for survivability when you have a large number of armored minions aggroed upon you, although this particular example is probably a little bit exaggerated, as I seem to recall the keep difficulty was on veteran due to some of the recordings I needed to make the trailer. But the Conflag Staff isn't limited to deflecting just armored minions. The small bursts are absolutely amazing for deflecting things like both assassins and leeches, which when combined with the extra charge up speed, provides an amazing amount of crowd control when utilized properly as you can see in this example where I deflect two leeches. But anyways, let's move on to part 8. Ability Mastery, Path of Flames. Now, one of the amazing assets in the Battle Wizard Toolbox is the ability to push bosses over ledges which is especially useful for weave gameplay, as you're often confronted with multiple boss spawns that aren't always intrinsically necessary to kill in order to progress to the end event, but rather poses a huge and constant threat that even when mitigated and avoided, can still end up costing you the win due to the factor of time. But regardless of whether you choose to kill it or avoid it, 
it might just slow you down enough to be the deciding factor, which provides yet another scenario where the battle wizard can shine bright. Now the reason for this is quite obvious, she has the only career ability in the entire game which can physically move a boss spawn not once, but twice. <sighs> and people say minotaurs are hard to kill. Now obviously you're not always gonna find yourself in a scenario where it's that easy, but I do think it might help to isolate the scenario to just you and the boss spawn in order to better visualize exactly what the strategy should be. Now paradoxically the boss which most people consider to be the hardest is actually the easiest to position yourself for in order to push it over a ledge. Simply place yourself in decent proximity to said ledge and aggro the minotaur from afar. Assuming you're fairly confident dodging the minotaur's charge, the rest really should be a piece of cake as the minotaur even stops for a moment, granting a sufficient time window to place it confidently. Now granted this makes it look a lot easier than it actually is, but what it really comes down to is your confidence executing said mechanic. Now obviously it's not always gonna be a minotaur, and assuming you don't have the luxury of one of your teammates aggroing the monster to the ledge, the danger comes from the monster potentially pushing you over the ledge rather than the other way around. Now, there are two ways to mitigate this risk, the first of which requires a wall or a blocker next to the ledge that you then use to try and get around the boss spawn using the wall as a safety feature to position yourself such that you can push him off. Although admittedly this is a dangerous strategy for a number of different reasons, as it requires controlling the forward momentum of the boss whilst leaving a gap on the correct side large enough for you to slip past him so you can push him off. But there is in fact a better way which is especially useful when dealing with a chaos spawn as you risk the chaos spawn otherwise picking you up and throwing you over. Now the idea here is that you don't actually have to be behind the boss spawn in order to place your teleport behind him. In other words, rather than moving around it, you move through it. Now the benefit of this strategy is that it doesn't require a barrier or a safety net and whether or not you succeed largely comes down to precision, as moving the boss even slightly sideways can easily prevent you from a successful execution. Oh for fuck's sake, just fall down already. Now if you're especially badass, this strategy can be applied to a charging minotaur, however I would not recommend it as timing the dodge is simply way 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 easier. Now for all of these examples, I've isolated you and the boss spawn since at the end of the day, you can only really affect your own gameplay. But the thing is, thankfully, you're rarely on your own in Vermintide. And even if you fail your own execution, simply showcasing an obvious attempt to push the monster off the ledge will quite often prompt a reaction from your team since, let's be honest, who doesn't want to be the one to make Rad Ogre go fly fly? Get wrecked, motherfucker! I wonder if a Rad Ogre can fly fly? No, must help Rat Ogre learn to fly. Yay, Rat Ogre fly fly. Go teamwork. Oh wait, I forgot, you need wings to fly. That's a bummer. But no, jokes aside, Firewalk is one of the most versatile career abilities in the entire game. And it's obviously not just limited to pushing bosses off ledges and setting stuff on fire, but it's also a great tool for saving your teammates, even when their positioning was terrible. <coughs> Claude Alpha. I told you I'd get revenge for all those times you killed me once we finished the weaves. <laughs> oh, that was close. Oh shit, oh shit. Oh, oh fuck. Dodged it, dodged it. My god, I'm amazing at... Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> no, but for real though, almost no matter how dire your teammate's circumstances are, if you are in range of the first ulti and you play it accordingly, pretty much anything short of something like a direct assassin pouch should prove no obstacle to getting both in, resurrecting, and back out again. Even a boss spawn of any variety, perhaps with the one exception of a really distant minotaur charge in combination with you timing it horribly, is ever gonna pose an issue to actually saving your team, due to the amazing combination of both mobility, stagger effect and double use allowing you to not just save your teammate, but ensure your own safety along with it. Which neatly brings us to part 9. Strategic focus and proper positioning. Now, in any scenario where shit hasn't hit the fan yet, your primary focus is that of a DPS dealer. But unlike most other DPS dealers, at least in the context of high level weaves, you are slowly killing everything rather than quickly killing individuals. But doing so effectively requires a certain amount of wiggle room. And although perfect positioning is not always an option, and you have to make do with what you got. 
But the absolutely crucial thing to understand here is that equally important to your actual positioning is your understanding of your current positioning. Which is to say, knowing whether or not you have to worry at any given moment is what's gonna allow you to act accordingly in order to minimize your risks and maximize your efficiency. Now, since space equals efficiency on the Battle Wizard, more often than not, you're gonna find yourself as the rear guard rather than the front guard. And being a paranoid motherfucker is absolutely crucial whenever you don't have a barrier behind you. Which is why in the span of just 9 seconds, I looked behind me a total of 4 times. The last of which likely saved my life. But surely, if you killed everything from the start of the map up until your current positioning, and you just looked behind you, there's nothing to worry about, right? Just like a honey badger, Vermintide doesn't give a fuck, and will systematically spawn small packs of trash minions behind you. Which is just one of a numerous amount of reasons positioning is immensely important, and should in the context of high level weaves be structured around the battle wizard's safest location, rather than moving down the stairs for absolutely no reason leaving me in a position where I can't do anything except block Xarnov, <laughs> Xarnov! Yes, yes, Claude, you don't have to spam help. Unlike you, I am aware of my team's positioning. <laughs> Apply cold water to burned area. Obviously, I'm just kidding. Claude is without a doubt slightly better than a bot. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, that one just slipped out. You can consider us even now. And for real though, Claude is a great player, and so is Slash Kex, and so is Main Kill. And just in case you're curious, Claude had this annoying habit of killing anyone who was at low HP once we finished the weave, which more often than not was me, since I like to run heal share on the battle wizard, which in of itself wouldn't bother me, except for the fact that because he always played the Zealot, every single time you retaliated, his passive ability would kick in, turning him invulnerable for several seconds. He once did it like 6 or 7 times in one evening, and so obviously something had to be done, but enough about that. Now, let's talk a little bit about survival in these next two clips. Now, in the first one, I'm gonna show you guys why it's absolutely crucial, necessary, to have 60% block cost reduction and the extra stamina on high level weaves. And just for reference, this is weave 103. Now, as the elf tries to reposition so we can gather the team, I really have no choice here but to try and follow. And at first glance, it didn't seem too bad, but once I pulled off the second TP, I quickly realized that I might be totally screwed. Now, whenever you're in a locked up scenario like this, you still want to dodge as much as you possibly can, simply in order to make your stamina charges last longer. Now, through a mixture of dumb luck, help from my teammate, and the correct build, I somehow managed to pull through from positioning hell to positioning heaven, allowing me to simply burn stuff without a care in the world. Did you already forget? Minions are gonna fuck you up from behind. Look, right there. Called it. Now let's take a look at a somewhat similar scenario, but with one major key difference. We're on our own. Now I restrained myself from using my staff in the previous scenario because I knew I had a team and the risk was simply too great. But when you're on your own in a confined area and you find yourself unable to move, you simply have no choice but to pull out your staff, risk taking damage, and using it to stagger enemy minions. Now it becomes obvious in slow motion. I got out, I actually thought I was fine. But then I got completely stuck, I got hit by a minion, two leeches spawn, whilst you're completely incapacitated, you have no choice but to hit them before they hit you, and the only way to do that is to equip your staff. But what I'm trying to get at here is, you need to get comfortable using your staff in super close proximity to enemies. And just to be absolutely clear, we're talking about a battle wizard with a conflex staff right now, and not other varieties. Moving on, I want to show you guys an extreme example of two players from my Season 1 Leaf team, which beyond just good positioning, illustrates great team dynamics derived from a clear-cut mutual understanding of their individual responsibilities. Now, Kruber wouldn't be able to kill those minions in a million years, whilst the battle wizard would be screwed the moment you had minions on two sides. So instead, the foot knight functions as a clear barrier, giving the battle wizard plenty of space, but at the same time requiring him to move backwards for a vast majority of the time, which is why the wizard peeks ahead as often as she can, and subsequently staggers the minions whenever Kubu makes a forward run for it. Now, keep in mind that things were a bit different in Season 1, probably more than a bit. For starters, the Death Weave souls actually dealt damage, rather than just converting the green HP into temporary HP, and the damage multipliers were so extreme at the highest weaves, that a single soul could one-hit the Kruber, which is precisely why the gap had to be so large. 
Cooper would avoid getting kills by any means necessary in order for all of the souls to automatically follow the battle wizard, who subsequently had a gap large enough that the souls would fade before ever reaching her. And although it didn't work out, I think a lot of players could learn something from these two. Oh, Claude of Just kidding. In fact, I thought I'd use this clip with Claude to just showcase how it all looks in first person. Now, there's only two of us left, and this is not a particularly great place to be. However, in order to progress to the point where we can save our teammates, we first have to get through a couple of triggers, upon which we decide to move back towards a more favorable position. Now, notice here, as soon as I'm in the back, and Claude is in the front, it is 100% my responsibility to be aware of what's behind us, since Claude needs 100% of his focus on keeping back the storm vermin so that I get room to breathe, and we eventually manage to find a good bottleneck location from which to fight. Now, this location was in fact improved upon even further by the fact that there was a live storm fiend, dishing out significant amounts of friendly fire, helping us to clear everything out. Which brings us to the final chapter. A flaming blizzard of a wizard. Now, just to start things off, I thought I'd show you this death-defying example played by my season 1 weave mate Hooch, who, with a combination of great skill and dumb fucking luck, manages to actually pull this off. Now, if you've seen this clip before, then thank you. So that means you're watching my Epic Wins Legendary Fails videos, in which I put a clip at the end of Dumbledore from Harry Potter saying, I hereby grant. Gryffindor helps! 60 points! <laughs> also, I like to think that uh, I helped him out with the emotional support, which I'm sure we can all agree should attribute for at least 50% of the credit of this play. Well fucking played, Hooch. Well fucking played. Now, this is Weave 120, and throughout all of these clips, you're gonna see several of the different things we talked about in effect, but for this clip there are two things that I want you to be especially aware of. The first is my use of the contact staff to control the rate of assassins that are about to hit us. The second is my positioning in relation to the rocks behind me, which I was hugging as much as possible for two reasons, the first and most obvious of which being not getting hit in the back when using my staff, but more importantly as a means to decrease the angles of attack the assassin could pouch me from as my visibility was poor to say the least. But I managed to keep the storm vermins at bay, since I knew my back was safe, I could always face them, which makes my stamina much more efficient, and coupled with a burst here and there, it wasn't completely unmanageable. But I don't care how experienced you are. You're not human if your heart rate doesn't go up just a little bit when you're confronted with this amount of assassins. But through a mixture of skill and luck, which I would say that all great plays have, I managed to survive three simultaneous assassins in the midst of what was essentially a Kata 3 Stormbremen patrol. Now, for this next clip, which also happens to be Weave 120, we're trying to take shelter in this cave over here due to a wave of assassins approaching, but as you're about to see, things don't exactly turn out orderly. The first thing you're gonna see in action is to save your teammate almost no matter how bad it is principle, which the Battle Wizard is just absolutely fantastic at, and although things don't exactly feel structured at this point in time, we get Cooper back up and seem to manage just fine. That is until half a Chaos Patrol decides to charge us from the front, pushing us into the cave. And rather than helping, Slash Kex on the handmaid makes the exact right decision of rotating to the opposite side of the cave as quickly as possible to clear it out, as to make space enough to prevent that we get mushed together. Unfortunately, however, his face caught an assassin, which made me realize that I now had to rotate in order to prevent large amounts of minions from accumulating just behind my teammates that were already fighting a fight on one side. But as it turns out, it was simply all too much, and we quickly got overwhelmed into a sort of every man for himself scenario, as the flamers were not just extremely disorientating, but on top of that, also prevented us from pushing into the cave while we had gunners on the outside of the cave. But almost as soon as Claude managed to take it out, it seemed like we were back into a somewhat controllable scenario, although this was definitely not the time to drop your guard and getting lured into a false sense of security. And if I recall correctly, this was actually one of the runs where we made it all the way and won the map. 
Now the reason I'm saying one of the times is when we made it to week 120 there was a glitch which caused the host to crash and so we ended up playing through it like 3 or 4 times. Which is why this clip is also week 120 and I, I promise this is the last clip from week 120. But there are a couple of things to notice here. The first is that because I have room I'm using fully charged attacks in order to deal as much damage as possible. And for this particular one I wasn't running heal share which made it even more important that I was using the heavy 1 attack rather than the heavy 2 in order to generate as much temporary HP as possible. Another thing to notice is how I'm using a constant set of small bursts not only to deal DPS but as a form of crowd control vastly decreasing the odds of one of your teammates getting hit and it's important to understand that in high level weaves this crowd control is as important if not more important than her ability to dish out damage since it not only keeps your teammates safe, but functions as a sort of damage in of itself, as it staggers the minions, putting their stagger count to 2, and allowing easy access for your enemies to simply just knock them out. Which again is just one of a numerous amount of reasons why the battle wizard is just amazing for weaves. And uh, I'm just gonna have to be honest here, and the answer is no. I have no fucking clue what just happened to that assassin. I don't know, maybe Sigmar held his hand over me or something. It seemed like the assassin just hit him in this wall midair. Or maybe it was because I said we got him with yours so really loudly inside my head. <gasps> but no, it ended up being just me and Claude versus what I can only assume to be an army of right-winged Hitler supporting Nazi rats. And my god, do I hit gas rats on Cata 3. Ah, the floor is lava! The floor is lava! So much lava! Careful! Careful! Ooh. Ooh. That was close! Anyways, moving on to weave not 120. <laughs> now, this wouldn't feel right without at least one clutch. Don't you agree? So instead I've added a double clutch, but neatly packed into one clip for your convenience. Which is totally and entirely what I was concerned about back in season 1 when I did this clip. <laughs> yeah, right. But anyways, but with that said, I think it's time. Uh, what time is it? Not what time. It's time. Time for what? You know, the, the thing. The thing we talked about. What thing we talked about? Oh, oh, the thing! Yes, that thing. What, what other thing could it possibly be? You know what? Never mind. I, I don't want to know. So, do you have it? I have what? Oh my fucking god, the thing! The thing we literally just talked about 10 fucking seconds ago. Uh, I, I don't know. Then who the fuck would not tell? Ah, calm, calm yourself. Calm yourself. Breathe. Just breathe. Calm yourself. You promised your mom no more rampages. Just take it easy. Uh, wait, are we going on rampage? No, we're, we're not. Just, just tell me where, where did you put it last? Where did I put what last? The, the thing for the thing that we're doing and talked about. What was the thing we talked about? Oh, well, that's right here. Oh, thank God. But no, no. Why didn't you? Why did you give it to me when I asked it for you just before? Wait, did you ask me for something? You know, you know what? Just forget it. Just give it to me. My God stupid people, am I right? Anyways, we have it, that's what matters. Now, unfortunately, my team wasn't left in the best situation here, and both of them unfortunately died, sending me into yet another solo scenario. Now, we're not gonna go through the whole clip, but I did think that this clip was worth featuring due to the extra stress factor of everything being invisible. Now, if there are specials on the loose, you always want to move inside here where you have at least some cover from things like assassins, gunners, leeches, and even gas rats. But really, it still comes down to being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And sometimes to survive, you simply need to have the balls to pull out your staff and stack up the minions in order to prevent getting fully surrounded. Now, unfortunately, I screwed up my ulti here and I ended up in a really bad position, but was eventually saved by the fact that the damage I had taken proved sufficient for me to generate my ulti back, which combined with the Kong pot gave me the last bit of thrust I needed in order to successfully finish the clutch. Anyways, I hope that you found these clips illuminating and that they at least somewhat took some of the theoretical aspects and put them into practice. And if not, then uh, too bad, because here's a free key for Vermintide 2 the game. First to grab it gets it. You snooze, you lose, or as we say in Denmark, no arms, no cookies. Which is entirely not applicable to this context, I just realized. But hey, it's an amazing fucking saying. So you just learned some Danish culture, motherfucker. And there's nothing you can do about it. Also, don't forget to join us. Join us. Please, it's totally free and you can always just unsubscribe. <laughs> also, I'd love to know, what was the favorite thing you learned in this guide? I mean, that is assuming you weren't already some sort of battle wizard, wizard or something <laughs> prior to watching this. In which case, hello Gandalf I am a huge fan. <laughs>
Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any thoughts, questions, or disagreements, feel free to let me know in the comments down below. Till next time, I love you guys. Stay awesome. Peace out. Fuck yeah.